Now, it gives me great pleasure at this time to introduce Milton Friedman, who will speak on the subject, The Role of Government in a Free Society. Thank you. The subject of the talk tonight is the role of government in a free society. And I think in discussing that subject, the first thing you have to do is to emphasize the very different meanings that free has. There are two quite different meanings of free which tend to get confused and which it's important to keep separate. The first is freedom in the sense of the absence of coercion. That's the sense in which I shall be trying to use the term. The second is free in the sense of free lunch, in the sense of absence of cost. The two meanings are very different, and there are few sources, few more important sources of confusion about the proper role of government in our society than the confusion between the two very different meanings of the word free. When we speak about the right to free speech, as in the First Amendment of the Constitution, that's the correct, that's the meaning of the term in the sense of the absence of coercion. That says government shall make no laws that interfere with the freedom of speech. It means that people shall be free to speak voluntarily to one another. It's often forgotten that a corollary to freedom of speech is freedom to listen. Freedom of speech does not mean the right to force anybody to listen to what you have to say. Freedom of speech means the freedom to stand up and hire a hall and offer to speak and let anybody come who wants to listen to you. A very sharp contrast to that kind of freedom is the freedom that was suggested back in the days of World War II by Franklin Roosevelt when he spoke of the four freedoms and spoke of the freedom from want. That's a very different kind of freedom. How can you guarantee one person a freedom from want except by coercing another person to provide the material means for his being free from want. Freedom from want involves coercion. It may be a fine objective, but it uses the word freedom in an altogether different sense. So when I speak of a free society, I mean freedom in the first sense, absence of coercion. And by coercion, I mean, very simply, the use of physical force or threat of force to make one person the instrument or agent of another person's will. It's very tempting to use freedom in a broader sense, to use coercion, I mean, in a broader sense. We often talk about people being coerced by opinion or by talk or by a TV program or by propaganda. Once you start down that line, I think you're in great trouble in preventing yourself from going very far indeed. Persuasion is one thing. Coercion is a very different. And by the freedom, we mean the absence of the physical force or the threat of force to make one person serve another. Now, obviously, if men are going to live in a society, there is no way in which you can have absolute freedom. There is a famous dictum of a Supreme Court justice that my freedom to move my fist is limited by the proximity of your chin. In a society in which there are many people, freedoms are bound to interfere one with the other. We are bound to have limits. And the question that we need to ask and the question that I want to talk about tonight 
is what arrangements in a society will minimize coercion while preserving the maximum opportunity for members of a society to cooperate with one another to achieve their separate objectives. The fundamental principle that I am going to try to uphold was stated by John Stuart Mill in On Liberty over a hundred years ago. And I quote from his statement in that essay. Quote, the object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individual in the way of compulsion and control. That principle is that the sole end for which mankind are warranted, individually or collectively, in interfering with the liberty of action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. That's the fundamental principle that I am going to take as a given as describing my own values in trying to discuss the question of what government, government's role in a society dedicated to promoting freedom in that sense, what its role is. From this point of view, the nation state is a means to an end, not an end in itself. This notion that the individual, or rather in our society, in every society, the family is a basic unit. That we have responsible individuals or families cooperating one with another to achieve their objectives is in very, very sharp contrast to the notion that the fundamental unit is the state, that you have a nation state, and that the individual serves, uh, the individual exists to serve the state. The right notion, from my point of view, is the other. The state, the government, is a means, an instrument through which we can, set, we can jointly serve some of our ends, but it's not an end in itself. We, patriotism may be a widely shared feeling because many of us feel a member of the same community. As we feel a member of the same family, we feel a member of the same low, smaller community and larger community. But that is a voluntarily shared consensus and the state is not an end in itself. The ultimate unit is the f individual or the family or such other voluntary groups as individuals may choose to participate in. And to a believer in a free society in this sense, the ideal is unanimity. The ideal is that you shall have joint action only insofar as people have been persuaded to act together. That you should have joint action only insofar as responsible individuals, after free and full discussion, have agreed jointly to cooperate in some venture. It's from this point of view that the market, voluntary exchange through buying and selling, is so important as a basis for a free society. The market has the enormous virtue that it enables you to achieve voluntary cooperation, to achieve unanimity without conformity. Everybody can do his own thing. Everybody can go to the store and buy what he wants to buy. If one man wants to, if one man chooses to have a shirt of one color, he can have that shirt. Another man, a shirt of another color, he can have another color. Everyone can do his own thing within the limits of his resources. However, there are some items where it is not feasible for everybody to do his own thing. There are some cases in which you must have uniformity. 
Some cases in which the answer must be the same for all the people. The most obvious example is in the case of national defense. There is no way in which some people in a country can be engaged in an international war and other people in a country can be not engaged in that war. The decision whether the country is at war is a yes or no decision that must be the same answer for all. Ideally, the ideal would be that we should not engage in such joint activities unless we have first achieved unanimity. But it is clear that that's not a feasible ideal. It is clear that you cannot, in a changing world, subject to problems that come up from time to time, that you cannot afford the time that would be required in order to get everybody jointly to agree on the same course of action. And hence, all of us who have lived in these kinds of societies, all societies of this kind have been led to adopt something short of unanimity, a majority rule as an expedient for reaching those kinds of decisions which require conformity. I, let me stress that the majority rule in that concept context is not a principle, it's an expedient. People generally are inclined to equate democracy with majority rule. I believe that is a great mistake. There is nobody who believes in majority rule as an absolute. There is nobody who believes that if 51% of the people should vote to shoot the other 49%, that that would make it okay. And our society in particular is, is erected on the notion that minorities have rights and not merely majorities. The Bill of Rights of our Constitution was an attempt to prescribe and assure in advance that majorities would not rule. And we are not willing to have a simple majority settle, settle everything. For some purposes, a simple majority will do. If it's more important to reach a decision than it is what decision to reach, fine, a majority will do. But if it's something fundamental, for example, a foreign treaty, our Constitution requires a two-thirds vote. If it's something even more fundamental, such as changing our basic Constitution, well then we provide that you must have much more than a simple majority. You must have a, a, a qualified majority of the various states as well as of the Congress. So majority rule is an expedient which we have adopted in those cases where we need conformity. Now the reason why this is important is because the use of the political channel for deciding issues, while it is absolutely inevitable, while you must do it, inevitably tends to strain the co social cohesion essential for a stable society. No society can be stable unless there is a basic, unthinking, unquestioning allegiance to certain common principles. You cannot in possibly conduct a society, have agreement, unless that basic homogeneity and consensus exists. But every time you have to reach an agreement that requires conformity. When a majority votes and a minority must conform, you strain that social fabric, you strain that cohesion. As a result, the political mechanism does least harm to the stability of a society in those societies that are most homogeneous and that have the closest approach to a common, va common values. Government, you can use a political channel, you can use government decision, government enforced conformity to a far greater extent in a country like Sweden, which has a highly homogeneous population with a very, very common set of values. You can go much farther than you can in a country where there is a wider variety of values as in the United States. The experience of Great Britain is a dramatic illustration of this phenomenon. At one time, 
you had a much greater homogeneity of values, much greater cohesion in Britain than you have had in the past 10 or 20 years. And one of the sources of Britain's problems has been the attempt to use political mechanisms in a society that is in getting increasingly diverse in its values and its beliefs, and where therefore there is a greater strain imposed upon that society. It's interesting to note that in the past decades, we have had a whole spate of regional conflicts develop. The most obvious are the move for autonomy in Quebec and Canada, the move for Scottish and Welsh autonomy in Britain. Why? Because as those countries have tended to come to rely more and more on the political mechanism and less and less on the market mechanism, they have tended to put greater strain on the things that were holding the society together. After all, so long as you rely on the market mechanism, the people of Quebec could go their way, the people of Ontario though are their way. When you rely on the political mechanism, you put much greater strain on the relations between the French and English in Quebec, between the French in Quebec and the people in Ontario. Again, if oil in the North Sea is going to be a private matter, it doesn't matter to the Scots whether they are independent of the Great Britain, but if oil is going to be handled by government, then it makes a great deal of difference to the Scots who is in charge of the oil development and exploration. Or come closer to home. Why have we had an expansion in this country of ethnic divisions, of, of differences among subgroups in the country? We always prided ourselves on being a melting pot. That did not mean that we converted people to identical items that we made one like another, but that we could, live we could live comfortably and conveniently with each group going its own way, with its own customs, and yet cooperating with one another on those areas which were of joint interest. But the more that we have turned to the political mechanism as a way to solve problems, to handle the allocation of resources, the more we have tended both to increase the advantage of ethnic isolation and to increase the frictions among the groups. So, if we are going to maintain a free society, especially in a society in which you have wide differences of customs and values and beliefs, it is essential that you rely as little as possible on the political mechanism and as much as possible on the market mechanism of voluntary cooperation where each group can go its own way. The view I'm expressing is a view that classically has been termed liberalism. In the modern day and age, the word liberal has come to mean almost the opposite of what it used to mean. If you look at the dictionary, liberal means of and pertaining to freedom. If you look at behavior today, liberal means of and pertaining to freedom with other people's money. <laughs> I am a liberal in the original sense, in the sense in which John Stuart Mill was a liberal, in the sense of which his statement was a statement of liberalism. And the liberal view that the justification for government action is to prevent coercion and to promote voluntary cooperation among responsible individuals leads to a very short list of basic functions which government should undertake. And I may say that short list is one which has a long intellectual history coming from Adam Smith down through uh, 
the, well, Adam Smith and I should say Thomas Jefferson and the writers of the Declaration of Independence and the original Constitution down through the philosophical radicals of the 19th century, Bentham and John Stuart Mill, down to the present. And these basic functions can be listed very simply. They are, first of all, to prevent one man from coercing another, the internal police function. They are, second, providing for external defense. These two are really part of the same, to prevent coercion, to prevent coercion from within, to prevent coercion from without. And beyond this, to promote voluntary cooperation among people by defining the terms under which we're going to cooperate together and by adjudicating disputes. Let me say a word about this problem of defining the rules of the game, the role of a legislature in a free society. Many proponents of a market society of private property take it for granted that property is something that is, defines itself. That's very far from the case. The, of the groups that are sponsoring this talk, the law groups know particularly that it's very far from the case. In fact, if it were obvious and evident, they'd be out of business. There's no natural meaning of property. It's all a question of convention. If you fly an airplane over my house, 10 feet above my roof, are you violating my property rights? What about if you fly it 10,000 feet? What about 30,000 feet? Obviously, that's not natural. And therefore, if we are going to cooperate with one another in a voluntary way, we have to know what the rules of this game we're playing are. What are the terms? What rights do I have? What rights do you have? And one of the very important and basic functions of government in a free society is to define those rules of the game and to adjudicate dispute among people. There's little dispute about the general character of these basic functions, although, of course, there's much debate about details. And I mention them in order to get them behind us and turn on to the more complicated and difficult and controversial questions. Because there are two additional functions which are much more difficult to handle, and yet, which it cannot be denied, a government and a free society may have to serve. The first of those is to provide a substitute for voluntary cooperation when such cooperation is for one reason or another not feasible. There are two classical cases that come under this heading. One is the case of technical monopoly, when for reasons of physical circumstance, it's not possible to have competition. The essence of avoiding coercion is the availability of alternatives. You, cannot, you can only coerce me if I have nowhere else to go. Every individual is protected from coercion by a seller by the presence of alternative sellers. A worker is protected from coercion by his employer only if there are alternative employers to whom he can turn, and so on down the line. But you have some cases in which it isn't technically feasible to have alternative suppliers. The classical cases are things like telephones, where it doesn't seem really feasible to have six telephone companies serving the same community so that each of you has to have six telephones, or so that each of you is connected to only one-sixth of the people in the community. And there are various other technical cases like that. They don't raise too much of a problem, the more serious problem, in the classical case, and the one I'm going to come back and discuss at greater length, is a problem of what are called neighborhood effects. Or, if you want the jargon of economists, externalities. Or, if you want still another jargon, third-party effects. These are the class of cases in which two people, in entering a deal with one another, have effects on third parties who, are, who didn't enter into the deal. 
The much discussed current cases of pollution and environment all fall under this heading. If somebody pollutes a river and somebody downstream gets polluted water, what you have is that somebody upstream is engaging and exchanging good water with someone downstream for bad water. There might be nothing wrong with that if the two have voluntarily made a deal to do so. But the problem arises when it isn't feasible to make this as a voluntary arrangement and when the person downstream gets the bad water willy-nilly and without having agreed to be subjected to it. Those are the cases of na neighborhood effects. That's one additional function, providing a substitute for voluntary cooperation. Another is to protect irresponsible people. We can only really believe in freedom for responsible individuals. But a society includes irresponsible individuals, of whom there are two major classes, children and the insane. I do not say those are overlapping. <laughs> On the contrary, they are largely disjunct. But we cannot really argue for freedom for either group. This is the paternalistic function of the society. And it's an, also an extremely troublesome one. We have resolved it in most free societies by assigning primary responsibilities to the parents, by taking the family as a unit in considering uh, uh, policies. But fundamentally, there remains the problem. That's, a, that's again an expedient, not a principle. We are not willing and should not be willing to treat children as the absolute property of their parents, which their parents may do with as they like. We really want to treat children as potentially responsible individuals whose freedom and opportunities must be protected. But that raises enormous difficulties. If the parents are not responsible, it is very difficult to find a surrogate that will do the job. Both the functions I've described raise problems because they are difficult to define precisely and even more to limit. There is an enormous range of activities which could be justified by, uh, by government, which could be justified or which you could attempt to justify on the grounds either that you have third-party effects or that you're dealing with irresponsible individuals. After all, in a complex society in which millions of people, tens of millions of people are cooperating together, there is hardly anything that people do that does not have effects on third parties, on people other than those who are directly involved in the arrangement. And there is hardly any policy. Well, that's an exaggeration, as I'll point out in a moment, but there are a very broad range of policies that can be justified on grounds of protecting irresponsible individuals, particularly if you allow the definition of irresponsible to be broadened. After all, a very large number of us know that there are two classes of people, ourselves and all those other irresponsible people. <laughs> Nevertheless, to digress for a moment, even in this vague form in which I've so far expressed it, the principles I've listed are not empty, as can be seen by just listing some of the present governmental activities that cannot be justified in terms of these principles, even on a very broad and very generous interpretation of neighborhood effects and irresponsible individuals. Let me just give you a small list. For example, on these principles, there is absolutely no way in which you can justify the imposition of safety requirements on autos and motorcycles to protect the drivers of those vehicles. You can justify safety requirements to protect third parties, to protect pedestrians, to protect others. Because in that case, 
you do have an effect of third party effect. But how can you justify safer the requirements which are intended to protect the driver himself? If you think of Mill's, John Stuart Mill's statement, that the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. His own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. Indeed, I must say, I have long regarded the law various states have requiring motorcyclists to wear helmets as a kind of a litmus test of whether a person really believes in freedom or doesn't believe in freedom. If I am riding a motorcycle, I may be a fool and stupid not to wear a helmet to protect myself, but it's my life. What right does a state have to tell me that I must wear a helmet in order to, for my own good? Is not the right to commit suicide a basic human right? It's not one we would like to see exercise. Well, there are some, for some we would. <laughs> but in general, it's not one we'd like to see exercised. And in general, we would certainly try to do our best to persuade any friend of ours not to exercise it. But when you come down to the ultimate point, how can we justify saying it is illegal to commit suicide on John Stuart Mill's grounds? I warn you that you must beware of the answer which you will be given, as I have been given when I have tried this on various times. And it's in a way a correct answer. It shows how wrong breeds wrong. Because the answer I have been given is that, well, now after all, you do have to uh, require the helmet on a motorcyclist. Because when a motorcyclist spills himself on the road and spreads himself over the highway, he isn't really only hurting himself. A government ambulance will come to take him to a government hospital. He will be uh, uh, buried with a government subsidy. And his wife and children, if there are any, will thereafter be entitled to government welfare payments. And therefore, when the motorcyclist spreads himself over the road, he really is harming the rest of society and not merely himself. Well, you think about that proposition for a while and you can see what it leads to. What it says is that each of us is the property of the U.S. government and that we each of us bear on our back a sign, property of the U.S. government, do not fold, mutilate, or spindle. <laughs> there are a host of similar paternalistic regulations for adults which cannot be justified in any way, shape, form, or manner by the general principles I've been talking about as a, potential, as a possible functions in a free society. In addition, you cannot along these grounds justify tariffs on imports or restraints on exports, with minor exceptions for special cases of national defense. You cannot justify on these grounds parity prices on agricultural products or rent control as you have it in New York, or general wage and price control as was imposed by Nixon in 1971, or the current price controls on natural gas and oil. You cannot, you cannot justify along these lines government control of output through farm programs, state oil commissions, Federal Energy Administration, the detailed control of industry through ICC, the FCC control of radio and television, which I think is a particularly pernicious control because of the extent to which it violates fundamental freedom of speech. And to get to a point which would require much fuller discussion to uh, persuade you of it, you cannot, in my opinion, justify along these lines compulsory social security or licensure provisions denying the right of a person to practice an occupation unless a governmental commission has certified that he may do so. Now, as I say, I could go on and on with this long list. I list it merely to point out that the principles and the views and the beliefs in freedom, even on this vague level, are not empty. But let me digress for a moment to tell a story along these lines. One, some years back, I had a debate at the University of Wisconsin with Leon Kaiserling, 
some of you may have heard of him, a notorious lawyer turned economist. <laughs> and Kaiserling and I were debating essentially the issue of the role of government in society. And in his attack on me, he uh, decided to show how silly and absurd and, and absolutely uh, uh, far out I was. And so he did so by taking a list of a similar kind which I had in my book, Capitalism and Freedom, and starting to read it. Well, now I should say this was some years back when the United States was engaged in the Vietnam War and when uh, students were subject and everybody, all young men, were subject to military conscription. And he started to read one item after another about how can you be so stupid and absurd to say that there's no justification for safety regulations or for tariffs or for price controls. And then he came to the point where I had in that list and there's no justification for military conscription. And of course, the student audience immediately started applauding to the end and Kaiserling lost that debate right then and there. <laughs> But there is no justification for military conscription to a believer in freedom. It's another one of these things which you can readily rule out once you start from that premise. But I want to take the rest of my time to talk about the difficult cases, to return to these so-called externalities or neighborhood effects, which have been used to justify such a very, very wide range of governmental activities. The general approach has been to regard any example of this as a case of market failure. That's the term that has been used. To say, well, after all, this is something that the market cannot take care of. For example, the classical case has always been the smoke nuisance case. The electric utility puts smoke in the air. The smoke makes my shirt dirty. That imposes costs on me. They don't have to pay me for it. And so they are imposing costs on me without my consent, and therefore the argument is that's a market failure. And so it is. It is a failure of the market. If you want to see what's involved in this, I submit to you a very simple example. Contrast the problem of a utility in driving its trucks, which have automobile accidents, with the problem in putting out smoke. Suppose I asked, you know, one of the things that people tend to talk is as if the desirable thing is to have no pollution. Now that's obviously silly. We could have no pollution in this room very quickly if everybody just stopped breathing. But the cost would be a little higher than the gain. And in the same way, suppose you asked yourself the question, what's the right number of automobile accidents for a utility to have? Now offhand that seems like a silly question. Why, of course, it shouldn't have any automobile accidents. But maybe the only way in which the utility could avoid automobile accidents would by having its trucks never go more than three miles an hour and only between the hours of two in the morning and four in the morning when there are no other cars on the road. And that would raise the costs of producing electric power very much. It would make it necessary to raise the prices to customers. It would raise the cost of power to customers. So that's obviously silly. On the other hand, if the utility has an automobile accident, until we went down the wrong road of no-fault insurance, the utility was liable to pay the damages to anybody it hurt. And therefore, if it drove its cars in such a way as to increase the number of accidents, it, increased its it reduced its costs of producing utilities, it increased its costs through accident payments, and it had the right incentive to have the number of accidents in which the extra cost in the form of increased liability payments just matched the extra gain from cutting its production costs. No problem arises, there's no market failure. Why? Because it's easy to identify who is hurt and who did the hurt. And so you can make it the subject of a market transaction. But when I come to the dirty shirt, which the same utility puts out, and in principle I ought to have the solution to the right amount of smoke, in the same way, the costs, the transaction costs, the costs of entering into the deal, of finding out who dirtied my shirt and of getting them to pay for me are just greater than it's worth paying for the benefit. And as it turns out, hard though it is to believe, 
Almost all externalities or neighborhood effects arise out of these transaction costs. Now, as I say, the approach has been to regard any minor, any market failure, however minor, as a sufficient excuse for government intervention. The market has failed, therefore the government should step in. But this is a basic error because it involves a double standard. There's not only such a thing as a market failure, there's also such a thing as a government failure. That's not unknown in the modern society. And hence, the cure may be worse than the disease. And there are two very important reasons to expect government failure to be very prominent. The first is that the very features that inhibit the market solution also inhibit government solution. If it's difficult in the market to know who has benefited or harmed whom, it's difficult for government to know who has benefited or harmed who and to put in corrective action. But a much more important reason is that government actions have laws of their own. And you and I, as well-meaning people, may say the government should step in to correct that market failure. But once we get the government into its, the act, it's going to go along according to its own rules. And those rules will mean that the ultimate results are very different than the initial intent. The will will be different than the deed. And when the government steps in and makes mistakes and has failures, they're going to be big failures and not little ones. We've had some dramatic examples that illustrate my point very quickly. Four or five years ago, the government required all producers of children nightwear to add tryst to the nightwear in order to make it flameproof. And lo and behold, throughout the country, every manufacturer of children's nightwear added this substance to it. Four years later, the government discovers that the chemical tris is carcinogenic. And lo and behold, every dealer throughout the country is required to take the uh, nightwear off its shell. An example of government failure of a large scale. Again, in the early 1970s, on grounds of reducing pollution, the government required on a wide, wide scale utilities and manufacturing firms to convert from coal to oil and gas. Now the government is trying to get laws passed to require them on a large scale to convert back. So it's obvious that the fact that you have market failure is not a reason to have government to uh, call on government unless you take into account the fact that you may have government failure and that the end result may be worse than the situation you started with. Because of this possibility, it's worth re-examining, and this is a final point I really want to discuss, it's worth re-examining the existence of other ways to cope with market failure than calling in government to redress the balance. I think one of the great difficulties in discussions of this kind is a tendency to proceed as if there's only a pure market on the one hand and a pure government on the other, and to neglect the whole host of intermediate voluntary arrangements which they are, which tend to arise when there are market failures. Because after all, the existence of market failure implies a potential gain and hence gives an incentive to solve the problem. Let me give you some very simple examples. One which I owe to my son is a custom of tipping. Now you know it's worth stopping and thinking about the custom of tipping. There's not a person in this room who doesn't tip even though he doesn't himself ever expect to come back to that restaurant and have that waitress serve him. Why do you tip? Not for self-interest. Tipping serves a very important social function. There is a market failure here that has to be redressed. How do we have an arrangement under which people are induced to give good service? Well, the best way to do it is to make it worth their while to give good service, to, to uh, reward people who give good service, and to punish people who give bad service. But how do we do that? If you or I are going to come back to the same place time and again, it's easy. But if we're not, how do we do it? 
Well, we have developed a very extensive social custom for exactly this purpose, that without thinking about it, all of us act as if we were serving the interests of other people in tipping for good service. Politeness serves the same exact social function. I'll give you another very trivial and, and uh, basic example. All of us who have traveled on highways around this country have recognized the great social value of conveniently available rest facilities. Now, why on strict pre business principles should any, should any uh, gas station provide rest facilities to people who aren't going to buy gas there? He's rendering a benefit to a third party. Surely, if you were to think of market failures, you would say, well, no gas station would do that. And therefore, there would be no way in which this useful social function could be provided. But in fact, it is provided. In some cases, by governmental stations. But more generally, because there are national, national chains of gas stations, which benefit, as they see it, from goodwill in providing these facilities. Because in other cases, the cost of enforcing payment, the co cost of restricting the use of the facilities, only to those people who are going to buy gas there or pay for it is greater than the gain from doing so. And so society has developed a technique for handling this case of market failures. Many other cases. Here in Palo Alto, you have local associations of homeowners who join together voluntarily in order to provide services for the group as a whole. But I want to come to a more interesting and sophisticated case, which is especially relevant here and to this audience. And that has to do with the private subsidization of basic scientific research. One of the standard examples of market failures, one that you will find time and again, is that since basic scientific research yields knowledge which is not patentable and which cannot be uh, uh, kept secret, the major benefits from research go to people other than those who do it. And therefore, there is no incentive. Let me give you a quote from a professor here at Stanford, Professor Henry Rowan of the Business School, in writing on energy, in which he says, and I quote, research, i.e., those activities in which the private sector underinvests, because many of the benefits are not appropriable by firms. Well, now, let's stop and look at that. It is true that society has very great benefits from research. There are real third-party benefits. But is it true that society has not developed a mechanism to finance it without governmental assistance? Not at all. Society has developed a very ingenious mechanism. Universities exist, and universities are institutions which are selling three products. They are selling schooling, they are selling research, and they are selling monuments. <laughs> and the monuments serve to finance the research. And it's, they serve to, and the monuments are linked to the research precisely because the research has third party effects and cannot have benefits that are appropriable. If Mr. X or Mrs. X wants to honor her ex-husband, Mr. X, <laughs> No one would regard it as an honor to have a factory building on the uh, XY, on the, uh, I better get the ABC <laughs> manufacturing enterprise to have, build a factory there and say that's the X factory. Because everybody says, oh, well, that's no honor to them. They're just doing it to make money. On the other hand, if Mrs. X puts up a Mr. X library on Stanford campus, that's a great honor to Mr. X. Why? Precisely because it is associated with something which is rendering a public service and which cannot be appropriated privately. So that in fact, long before government stepped into the financing of basic research, there were in fact extensive funds being devoted to basic research through the development of institutions which engaged in tie-in sales of research and monuments. <laughs> 
This case is very interesting and I think very important because it brings out another very important distinction that is often confused. That's the distinction between third party effects, the effect on society on the average, and the effect of an additional bit, uh, additional measure. Let me go back to the research. Once you recognize that there would be a great deal of research, a great deal more research than can be financed, than can be justified by the f returns appropriable by individual firms, once you recognize this social institution that has grown up voluntarily to finance basic research, it's no longer so obvious there's any room for additional government funds. Now, I recognize that that's heresy in this room where most of us are being supported by those additional funds. But nonetheless, it's heresy worth considering. If there were no source of support outside of strict, profit-seeking, narrow firm support, then you would have to uh, recognize that the benefits to society from a little extra research will almost surely more than balance the costs associated with raising the funds to finance it that way. Because that's the other side of the problem. Every time government steps in, it has third party effects too. The government invariably raises the money from people other than those whom it's intended to benefit. It invariably introduces friction into the society and more important than any of this, it threatens the freedom of the society because of the intimate connection between limited government on the one hand and human freedom on the other. But nonetheless, if there were no source of support for basic research other than private profit-seeking enterprises looking at their narrow self-interest, almost everybody would agree that there would be a strong case for, a, for governmental subsidization. But now, let's suppose you have a great deal already from this private arrangement I've described. How do you know that it's worth having some more? If you'll pardon my jargon, how do you know that the marginal benefit is greater than zero? The average benefit may be positive. On the whole, society may benefit. Let me illustrate how important this is. Henry Ford, when he introduced the Model T and developed the automobile industry, undoubtedly conferred enormous third-party benefits on the, on the society as a whole. He made it possible for millions of people to live a different kind of life. Was that an argument for the government subsidizing Henry Ford? Not at all, because he had plenty of incentive to do it without the government subsidizing it. And at the margin, given that he was willing to do it and go as far as he was, it's not clear that extra development of that automobile would have added, added extra benefits. In the same way, once you recognize the importance of distinguishing between the margin and the average, the extra, and the whole thing, you will immediately see that most of the, that a very large fraction of all the arguments for government involvement on the ground of external effects, of neighborhood effects, of third party effects fall to the ground. Now, I do not want to suggest that you take the easy way. I don't want to say whenever there's a problem, something will come up to solve it. I think that's too easy an answer. There are real issues here. Nobody can set forth a hard and fast line on what government should or should not do in concrete form. What all of us can do is to try to find out what are the principles on the basis of which to judge governmental activities. We have to think in terms of a balance sheet in which for any proposed governmental activity here are the advantages, here are the disadvantages, how do they balance out? What I'm suggesting is, first, that we should be much more sophisticated in constructing that balance sheet than we have been. There has been so much of a tendency to look only on one side of the balance sheet at the alleged gains, not at the other, the costs. So much of a tendency to assume that the will is a deed, that if the intentions are good, 
the results will follow. So the first thing I want to emphasize is the importance of really exploring seriously what alternative mechanisms there may be for resolving these real problems before we turn to the government. Moreover, when government was very small, 50 years ago, when total government spending in the United States was less than 10% of the national income, when federal government spending was 3% of the national income, it was understandable that you could have a one-sided attitude. If in doubt, why not have the government try it? What harm can it do? But today, when government spending is 40% of the national income and federal government spending is over 25% of the national income, the situation is quite different. There is no excuse for this one-sided attitude, especially with the added experience we have had over the past decades of government failure. Indeed, as of today, it is hard not to start out by saying that the right way to go is to assume first that the, there's government failure before you look at market failure. I have discussed the role of government from the point of view of a believer in freedom. But the actual explosion in government has reflected three different forces. In my opinion, it has reflected first the failure by believers in a free society to understand the implications of their own values. Many of the expansions in government have been, have been brought about by people who were seriously and sincerely seeking to promote freedom of the society, who believed in a free society, but did not recognize the dangers to freedom from the governmental extensions they were, they were supporting. But second, a very wide range of governmental activities have occurred because of the pressure by people who do not believe in freedom, by the attempt by people to impose their values on society, the paternalistic view, the belief that some know better what's good for the public at large than others, the belief that the natural elite should rule. Indeed, many of the objections to a free society, many of the objections to the use of the market are precisely that it limits the power of some people to impose their will on other people. It makes it hard to do good. And it does. With a little of a market, with a big free enterprise sector, it's very hard to do good. But by the same token, it's hard to do a evil. And, what, and in a society of imperfect human beings, with the experience we have had, it's worth paying a big price in reducing the chances of doing good in order to avoid the chances of doing evil, especially when one man's good is another man's evil. Third reason why you have had an actual explosion, why you have had such a big explosion in government, is because of non-ideological pressures by all sorts of groups to use government for private advantage. That's been a major source, as we all recognize. And we are among those groups. We mustn't blame other people. All of us are only too willing to see government expand in areas that benefit us. What we object to is paying when it benefits somebody else. The importance, I haven't really discussed these second and third pressures because of limitations of time. I've really tried, rather, to put in broad focus what for a believer in freedom is the proper and appropriate role of government and how to think about that role of government. And I believe that is important because I believe the failure by believers in a free society to understand the implications of their own values has often led them to collaborate with their ideological opponents and to serve as front men for non-ideological special interests. So that if we can be more aware of what our values imply because I say our values because I think they are the values of most of us. I do not believe that the people of this country are really divided very much by their basic values. I believe most of them, given the choice, would set a very high value on freedom and on the freedom to pursue their own objectives. 
But a lack of understanding has, in my opinion, led those who believe in freedom sometimes to collaborate with their, ide with their enemies. Thank you.